Okay. Okay, thanks everyone for coming to today's AI seminar. I'm happy to introduce Professor Chen Yi Zhang, who just joined Purdue University as an assistant professor in computer science department. And uh, Chen Yi, uh, specialty is in uh, software engineering and also um, uh, computer uh, human interactions. He actually develops lots of interesting interactive systems that augment human intelligence with data-driven insights and also augment machine intelligence with human guidelines with a particular focus on improving programming productivity. And uh, before he joining uh, Purdue, he was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard and he obtained his PhD from UCLA Computer Science in 2019. Actually, we attended the same holy ceremony. Yeah. So uh, Chen Yi had lots of uh, amazing works in this community, and uh, his work has been recognized with a best paper nomination from the ACM Chi Conference. So let's welcome Chen Yi to present his uh, talk about reseeking modern programming tools with human centered intelligence. All right, thank you, Mohal. Let me share my screen. And play the slides. All right. Okay, um, hello everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and thank you all for joining this talk virtually. Um, before the talk, I actually want to say that I'm not a core ML person, uh, but most times I look at AI from the human computer interaction and the software engineering perspectives. Um, and I hope my talk can actually bring a different flavor to this uh, seminar and encourage you to think more about you know, the human perspectives of AI. And today, today I want to tell you about how we should rethink and redesign programming tools with human-centered intelligence. And I think that this is a very timely topic because you know, last month or two months ago, OpenAI and the GitHub together released this uh, amazing um, programming tool called Copilot, which is powered by GPT-3. And it caused a lot of discussions on Reddit and Twitter. And I, I think this talk will bring up some of the limitations and also opportunities for this uh, large um, programming tools powered by large language models. Okay, so some of you may wonder, why should we care about programming tools? Um, you know, programming is a very powerful way of uh, leveraging computational power. And in the last decade, there has been an increasing number and a variety of people who need or want to write code. For example, the financial analysts need to write code to analyze data to make investment decisions. Data journalists write code to collect data from government websites to discover news stories. And the environmental scientists also have to write code to analyze experimental results and create simulations of physical events. Coding is also actually viewed as an essential skill for the future. Many countries and the social leaders are encouraging their citizens, especially the young generation, to learn coding so they can actually take part in creating the next generation technology that will change our world. But coding is hard. We have seen high dropout rates in coding boot camps. Um, the programming knowledge of many CS undergrads is quite brittle, and online communities such as uh, Stack Overflow are not so welcoming to novices and people from marginalized groups. And even, even for the experienced programmers, they actually often struggle when learning new programming languages and APIs. As a result, they have to frequently search for code examples to remind themselves how to use an API or a programming language. Over the years, there has been a joint effort from uh, several research communities, um, software engineering, programming languages, and AI to reduce coding barriers and also improve coding productivity. Uh, for example, we have seen many coding assistant tools that make code compilation suggestions in the IDE. And in the last decade, there has been a huge renaissance of inductive programming. And a famous inductive programming tool is FlashFail, which automatically uh, generates string transformations to fill out the spreadsheet, giving some input-output examples in Excel. And more recently, we have also seen a hype of natural language programming tools um, powered by large language, language models like GPT-3. 
for example, here, the user wants to generate a button that looks like a watermelon. And the GPT-3 model can actually automatically generate the HTML code for this uh, button, given the natural language description. If we look at this intelligent programming tools, at a high level, they all follow the same design. So basically, they take some forms of the user input, like a partial programs or natural language description, make some inference about the user intent, and then automatically generate code um, or make some uh, code recommendations. And the goal of this, uh, you know, these tools is always to maximize accuracy of automation which is often measured um, on some uh, benchmarks. And I, I want to argue that the current design, which only focuses on automation and accuracy is not sufficient. And the one reason is that those intelligent programming tools do not actually help users understand or trust the automation results. For example, in this screenshot, a code completion tool makes a bunch of recommendations about the optimizer to use when training a neural network. And given those recommendations, the programmers may wonder why these options are recommended, whether there are any alternatives to this uh, recommendation, and which option is a good choice for their own context, their own task. And you know, a recent study finds that code completion tools do not actually help programmers finish coding tasks faster or more, more correctly. And the main reason is that programmers still have to search online and spend a lot of time to understand and assess those recommendations. And the second reason is that the programming domain is often open-ended. It's very challenging to handle all possible tasks in the real world. As Sumit Guani, who is the creator of Flashfield pointed out, even though there is no doubt that those intelligent tools will get smarter and smarter, ultimately there will be limits to the complexity that no algorithm improvements can address. So new approaches are needed to solicit human guidance to solve these uh, challenging tasks in the real world. And instead of only focusing on the automation process and accuracy, we should also focus on the interplay between human users and the, those intelligent tools. And specifically, we should build tools that enrich user input and solicit user feedback. We should help users gain insights and build trust on automation and AI. And we should also help users understand and assess the automation results. And in today's talk, I will show you two systems to demonstrate this idea. I will first describe how we can redesign a data mining technique to help users explore the long tail of uh, API user patterns in the wild um, instead of, you know, only showing the top K common patterns as most uh, data mining techniques do. And then I will describe how we can redesign inductive programming with enriched feedback loops and the interpretability. So users can build a more accurate mental model of the inductive program synthesis process and provide a strategy feedback to guide the synthesizer. Okay, let's look at the first part. Um, nowadays, people make heavy use of APIs from third-party libraries and frameworks to build software instead of you know, building everything from scratch. However, APIs are hard to learn due to a lack of uh, documentation and examples. As a result, API misuse has become a prevalent cause of software bugs, crashes, and vulnerabilities. And just to show you some numbers, in popular C libraries, um, C projects like Linux and OpenSSL, 17% of bugs are actually caused by API misuses. And 88% of Android apps actually do not use the crypto APIs uh, properly, which like raises a lot of concerns about the, uh, you know, the security and privacy of this, uh, this uh, Android apps. But on the other side, since the open source movement in early 2000, a lot of software projects have been shared online. And in the software engineering community, there has been a growing interest in mining um, open source projects and identify frequent patterns for API usage recommendation and API misuse detection. And the fundamental assumption of this, all these data-driven approaches is popular is better. In other words, if a pattern occurs frequently, it's very likely to be, uh, it's considered likely to be uh, correct or preferred. 
But this assumption, you know, it, it may hold in many other domains, but not in API user in mining. Uh, research has shown that uh, many frequency uh, based API user patterns are not correct, especially for cri crypto uh, APIs and Android APIs. And furthermore, a recent study shows that there are many alternative patterns that occur less frequently, but are still correct. And also in practice, you know, developers actually want to see multiple API user scenarios and alternative patterns instead of just the most common ones. So they can better assess the relevance of these patterns to their own needs. So to overcome this limitation of existing mining techniques, I came up with this uh, new and ambitious idea, which is, is instead of only showing the top frequent patterns, how about we build this uh, bird's eye view over all the possible you know, API user scenarios on the internet? So people can get a comprehensive knowledge of using an API and identify the best pattern for their own user scenarios. But a big challenge of analyzing online code data um, at such a large scale is online code data is quite noisy. Suppose we are now navigating uh, through a pile of code examples for the file input stream API. If we look at individual examples, we may notice that even though all of these examples use the file input stream API, um, they may actually follow different naming um, conventions. And many of these code examples may have ad hoc details related to the project they come from, uh, but not necessarily uh, useful for the, for the API learners. And the same expression can also be written in very different ways in different examples. To handle these noisy examples, I first use uh, program slicing to remove ex ex extraneous code in those examples. And to help you understand what program slicing is, let's look at this, examples, uh, this example of file input stream API. Uh, you can see that there are some extraneous statements in this example that are less relevant to the API usage, um, but more related to the specific functionality of this code example, which is uh, counting the line number in a file. To remove these uh, specific details, uh, I first build the control flow graph of this snippet. Then from the statement where the file input stream object is uh, created, I do post-dominance analysis on the control flow graph to identify prior statements it depends on. And then I do depth user analysis to identify the code that defines the arguments of uh, this uh, file input stream or uses objects returned by this uh, file input stream. And so in this way, I can identify a minimal set of program statements that are dependent to the file input stream API. So developers, you know, learners, um, humans do not actually have to pay attention to other less relevant program statements in the learning process. And another thing I, I did to handle this noisy data is to cluster program expressions based on their semantic equivalence uh, instead of their syntactic similarity. And to explain this idea, let's uh, take a look at this uh, two code snippets as an example. Um, so these two if conditions are logically equivalent, but they are actually written in very different ways. And to recognize this equivalence, I need to first canonicalize the variable names in this uh, two if conditions with respect to their method call. And the equivalence of P and Q can be formulated as a satisfiability problem by checking whether P, um, the negation of P equals Q uh, as, uh, as expressed here in, in this uh, form um, is uh, satisfiable. And it can be checked as unsatisfiable uh, using a SMT solver. And in this way, even though the same expression is written in different ways in different examples, we can still recognize them and cluster them together. You know, static analysis like program slicing is uh, quite computationally expensive and it doesn't really scale to a large code corpus with uh, thousands of uh, projects. So to address this uh, scalability issue, I implemented our um, static analysis methods on top of uh, distributed mining infrastructure called the BOA. So basically BOA provides a query language and some uh, abstract syntax tree traversal primitives which allows me to actually implement a complex analysis like a depth user analysis and program slicing in this uh, query language. And the BOA also provides a nice compiler 
to compile all my analysis code um, written in a DSL to uh, map reduce jobs and then execute it in parallel in a cluster of machines. Um, and for each API, this uh, distributed analysis method uh, takes about less than 10 minutes to identify and analyze 55,000 code examples per API from 380,000 GitHub projects. And by doing this, for the first time in the history of software and mining research, we can actually scale static analysis and mining to more than thousands of open source projects. I further designed a compact API usage representation called a structured call sequence. At the, uh, at the bottom of this slide actually shows an example um, structured call sequence of the file info stream API, which is extracted from a sliced code example on GitHub. And the, the design of this representation is informed by previous studies on common API user questions, you know, uh, developers often ask when learning APIs. It keeps track of a diverse set of API user features people care about, you know, including the preconditions, um, co-occurring APIs, exception handling lo logic, object creation, and also, you know, the objects that pass into and uh, come out of the API call. And given all this uh, structured call sequences, we build a new interface that aligns and aggregates those uh, sequences into a single view. So compared with those uh, data-driven methods that only show common patterns, this interface actually shows both common and uncommon features in different categories, like different ways of constructing the arguments of an API call, different co-occurring API calls, different if conditions, as well as the different you know, exception handling logic. And by default, you know, this interface renders three distinct patterns in each category, but users you know, can click on show more button to actually um, increase the number of patterns in each category and explore the long tail of uh, infrequent uh, patterns. Uh, in particular, I want to point out that some uh, critical API user features like checking whether a file exists before reading a file may not occur very frequently. You can see it in the, in the, in the uh, histogram bar. And such an infrequent pattern can be easily ignored by existing frequency-based uh, mining techniques due to the low frequency. But this, um, but this bird's eye view actually brings more visibility of such infrequent patterns by showing both common and uncommon patterns in a single view. And the programmers can also select some patterns and build their own uh, matter patterns. And those patterns that never co-occur with uh, the selected patterns will, will disappear. And the histograms on the left will also be updated to reflect the conditional co distribution of the remaining patterns. And in this way, programmers can more interactively discover patterns of interest rather than you know, just staring at some pre-computed patterns you know, ranked order. So in the evaluation, a key question I want to figure out is, does this bird's eye view really help people build a robust API knowledge? And to answer this question, we did a lab study with 16 CS students and asked them to learn APIs using our bird's eye view interface versus using web search, which is actually the de facto way of learning APIs in practice. And we observed that participants using our interface answered more API user questions correctly, and they also provided more comprehensive answers to each question. So basically this implies that they were actually able to identify alternative API usage um, patterns using this bird's eye view, and those alternative, alternative patterns cannot be easily found if they only searching and browsing online code examples in a web browser. And what's really interesting to me is that when we ask participants to critique a uh, stack for example, and the participants using this bird's eye view give more comments about code safety and the functionality. Something like if I do not add this if check, the examples will crash on this uh, uh, invalid input. But users using the baseline tool tend to focus more on the superficial details like coding styles and refactoring. And more recently, we generalized this idea from API usage learning to neural network design. And this bird's eye view 
basically aligns a collection of neural network models in a Sankey diagram based on their model structures. And it also shows the distribution of uh, you know, different layers and hyperparameters people make use of. So basically in this way, those deep learning novices can actually interactively explore the common and uncommon neural network design choices using this uh, interface and make more informed decisions when they are building their own neural network. Okay, so the bird's eye view system I just showed you is a good example for programmers who feel comfortable with reading code examples and want to spend time learning how to code. But on the other side, there are many end users and novice coders who find it really hard to read code examples and only want to gather computational tasks done. And for these users, inductive programming could be a savior. So in the second half of this talk, I'm going to tell you what inductive programming is and how we can redesign inductive programming to support better user interaction and interpretability. Just in case you haven't heard about this terminology, inductive programming is essentially a code generation technique. It takes some high level specification from the user as input and then automatically generate a low level code that fulfills this specification. It's called inductive because the user specification is often input output examples, demonstrations, you know, test cases, et cetera which are often incomplete. And this requires generalization from those incomplete uh, specifications from the learner side. Um, even though the user specification is often incomplete, it's, uh, it's uh, much easier for the users to provide. Um, so that's, this is also why uh, inductive programming is getting really popular nowadays. And this is also in contrast to deductive programming which requires users to complete, uh, to provide some complete uh, formal specifications of the program to generate, and we, which is also um, often hard to provide for end users. And over the years, you know, research has shown that inductive programming is applicable to many domains, such as uh, text transformation, data extraction, database, network configuration, visualization, et cetera. To further illustrate this idea that let's consider this uh, data extraction domain. Suppose I want to write a program to only match US phone numbers from a document. I can add some positive and negative examples and then send it to the synthesizer or the learner. And then the synthesizer will then generate a program like a regular expression um, that matches this two positive example and does not match the negative example. Now you may wonder, you know, how does this uh, synthesizer generate this uh, regular expression? There are basically two key components in a synthesizer. One is the domain specific language that models this uh, program space. Uh, following the previous example, here I'm showing you a domain specific language for regular expressions in the context free grammar. And we can see this DSL has uh, some regular expression operators like uh, concat and also optional and uh, cleaning star. It can also include some general character classes such as uh, numbers, lowercase uh, letters, as well as individual characters like A, B, and one, two. And given the composability of a DSL, we can actually use this operators, limited number of operators and constants to define an infinite number of regular expressions. And the goal of inductive programming is to identify one program or multiple programs that satisfy user provided examples from this uh, huge program space. So speaking of that, the second key component of the synthesizer is actually a search algorithm over the huge program space. Here I'm showing you a very naive implementation of a top-down enumerate enumerative search algorithm. Given some input output examples, this algorithm will first initialize a work list with a question mark. And here a question mark is a partial program with a placeholder in it uh, for further derivation. And during the synthesis, uh, the placeholder will be concretized with different operators as constants in the DSL. And if a, if a concrete program is uh, generated, it will be evaluated 
with input output examples. In this case, this uh, regular expression num does not match any input output examples. So this candidate will be removed um, from the work list. And then the synthesizer will move on to process the second candidate in the work list. And this expansion will keep going on and on into a concrete program that satisfies all these three examples is found. And you know, to improve the search efficiency, you know, this inductive programming algorithms often use um, inductive biases, such as heuristics or, or learned distribution of existing code to decide which production rules in the DSL to use when expanding a partial program. Uh, but in this talk, I will just uh, stay with this very naive search algorithm to illustrate how we can augment it, th this uh, search algorithm with some uh, human-centered design. You know, ideally, a uh, synthesizer should be able to gener generalize those uh, input examples to a program in the user's head. But in practice, a synthesizer may generate a program that overfits this uh, input output examples. For example, here, the synthesizer generates a regular expression that matches strings starts with one. And apparently it's overfitting this two positive examples since both of these examples start with one. So as a result, the user has to provide additional examples like a new phone number that starts with two instead of one to clarify the user intent. And this synthesizer will then generate a new regular, regular expression to satisfy this uh, new example. And this clar clarification process will keep going on and on until the synthesizer generate um, something that uh, satisfy the user needs. And there are several major usability issues in inductive programming. The first thing is a big assumption of inductive programming is that users can actually provide high quality examples as a specification. But in practice, many users find it very hard and tedious to come up with many examples. And the second, um, novices and end users often have a hard time reading those uh, code and understanding its behavior. Even for experienced programmers, reading code is not always easy, especially when the code is written in an obscure language like a regular expression. Like I have used a regular expression for many years, but every time I see a regular expression, I have to look it up on Stack Overflow to figure out like what exactly it means. And finally, like many machine learning models, inductive programming tools are often designed as a black box. There is no way for the user to actually troubleshoot if a synthesizer is behaving weirdly or if there is any synthesis failure. To address this usability issue, I propose that we augment traditional inductive programming techniques with enriched feedback loops and interpretability. Um, there are three key components in my approach. The first component actually allows user to annotate their examples with some uh, semantic constraints. So users do not have to provide many examples to reinforce their intent. And the second component allows users to actually ask for additional examples to understand and validate a synthesis program. And the third component visualizes the synthesis process in a line, uh, in a line chart. Users can also you know, view the search directions of a synthesizer, um, what search directions the synthesizer has been through in a novel tree visualization. And now let me explain more about each component and show you how we, we need to adapt the inductive programming algorithm to support these components. If you look at our previous example of matching US phone numbers, you know, without a semantic annotation, a US phone number like this um, can be generalized in many different ways. But if the user mark uh, this uh, three letters, sorry, three characters, one, two, three, as a general class of digits, and then mark this hyphen as a literal value, then these annotations can be used to eliminate many search directions that do not treat one, two, three as a general or do not treat hyphen as a literal value. So, uh, and also on the other side, you know, this uh, semantic annotations also reduces a lot of effort to enumerate many other you know, examples that follow the same semantic pattern or the same semantic constraint. But on the other side, you know, 
the original algorithm cannot actually directly make use of the semantic annotations because it only takes input output examples as input. Um, I made several changes to the original algorithm. So the semantic annotation process, uh, sorry, semantic annotations can be incorporated into the synthesis process. Um, so basically I first convert this uh, semantic annotations to syntactic constraints about what the desired code should look like. And then each annotation is translated to an operator or a constant in the DSL. Here, this constraint actually says the final regular expression should include num and also hyphen. And later during this uh, program expansion, the synthesizer will try this operators first and constants first in this uh, constraints and then uh, to prioritize this uh, operators and uh, constants. Regardless, you know, the existing weights, they, they have uh, assigned to this uh, product use in the, you know, grammar. And the second component is about explaining synthesized code with additional examples. Given a synthesized regular expression, the synthesizer will generate many additional input or output examples to illustrate the behavior of the regular expression. And the way we actually build this, a big challenge we face here is uh, how to effectively generate additional examples. Of course, we can generate a lot of uh, you know, random input screens, but from the user perspective, reading a bunch of random inputs is a quite cognitive demanding. So instead of randomly generating inputs, I designed a coverage guided input generation algorithm. Basically, this input generation algorithm will first convert a synthesized uh, regular expression into a deterministic uh, finite automata or a DFA. And this DFA is a finance data machine that decides whether an input string should be accepted or rejected by a regular expression. And by traversing this uh, DFA, the algorithm can identify those uh, paths, paths in the finance data machine that have not been covered um, by the user provided examples on the left. And then this algorithm will actually uh, generate strings for each uncovered pass here. And so in this way, we can systematically identify corner cases users may not have thought of uh, before. And the biggest challenge I have encountered in this project is actually to open this uh, black box synthesizer and the support interpretability. As I mentioned earlier, the real design and the implementation of this uh, search algorithm is actually fairly complex. Even though I'm uh, familiar with this algorithm, I often have a hard time debugging it myself and figuring out what happens during the synthesis, you know, not to mention you know, explaining it to any users uh, who are not familiar with this technique. So my idea is that instead of explaining the algorithm, we can actually instrument to the synthesizer and render what kind of programs have been tried by the synthesizer so users can understand in what direction the synthesizer is searching and where the synthesizer is wasting a lot of time. But I quickly, but I quickly run into a problem. You know, the explored program space is huge. My synthesizer can actually generate and test up to 20,000 regular expression candidates within 20 seconds. That's actually a lot of programs to render. So instead of visualizing individual uh, programs, I created a new interface to visualize two key pieces of information that people often care about during uh, inductive programming, the search trend and also the search directions. So basically with this uh, new interface, after you add some examples and click the start button, you can monitor the synthesis process through a live updated line chart. And this line chart will show the speed and the trend of the underlying synthesis process. And then you can easily find out how many programs have been tried so far and how many examples uh, have been satisfied by each you know, program canvas. And if you find something weird, like the line being zigzagging for a while, you can actually make an early interruption and check what's really going wrong. And after each synthesis iteration, you can also look at the search direction of a synthesizer has been through. And th this tree visualization here actually clusters all explorer programs based on how they are derived from an empty program step by step. And the root of this tree is an empty program. 
Um, and the internal nodes are partial programs derived from the empty program. And by expanding, you can see that by expanding the internal node, you can also see how a partial program is further concretized during this uh, census process. And each branch of the tree can be viewed in a search direction. You can prioritize or um, a search direction that looks promising to you, or you can completely eliminate a search direction like, that looks uh, unproductive. In this way, uh, a user can actually manually prune the search space for the synthesizer and improve the uh, search efficiency. In particular, um, in order to build this uh, tree visualization, given many log programs, I need to first parse those uh, program candidates and uh, generate the der derivation pass of each uh, parse tree by perform performing this uh, pre-order traversal on the abstract syntax tree. And then I can cluster this uh, derivation pass into a single tree by merging you know, the identical nodes in the derivation pass. In order to disentangle the, uh, the effect of enriched uh, feedback loops with interpretability, I actually did uh, two separate user studies to evaluate, evaluate the system. In the first user study, I recruited 20, uh, sorry, 12 CS uh, students through mailing list at Harvard. And these participants have a diverse background in regular expressions and also selected three regular expression tasks from Stackflow. flow. Each student will complete two regular expression tasks in the study. One task using our enriched interaction mechanism and the other using a state of the, of the art interaction um, mechanism where a user can read and annotate synthesized code instead of uh, you know, examples. And the results are quite promising. When using our interaction mechanism, all, all 12 participants successfully finished their tasks, including the participant who knew nothing about a regular expression. But when using the comparison baseline, only four participants finished their tasks. And also it only took a half of the time to finish tasks when using this you know, um, enriched interaction mechanisms. And in the post-study survey, participants self-reported that they felt twice more confident when looking at those additional examples in our enriched interaction compared with you know, only reading code in the baseline interaction mechanism. And we also did a case study with 10, 20 regular expression tasks asking Stack Overflow. I demonstrated that our enriched feedback loops can be used to solve different kinds of realistic tasks effectively. Some of the tasks are quite challenging, like validate a decimal with two digits before dot and the five digits after dot, or like kind of like validate a 10 digit US style phone numbers uh, or validate comma separated numbers. And with this enriched feedback loops, uh, expert user who is already familiar with this uh, uh, UI can actually solve these challenging tasks in about three to eight minutes. But the plan synthesizer without any user feedback will take many hours to uh, solve these tasks. And the second user study actually focused on the census uh, interpretability. I recruited 18 students this time, and I picked two challenging tasks that I know the synthesizer will, will fail, it cannot solve. Um, I also deliberately include an easy task to counterbalance the, you know, this uh, task design. So during this study, a participant will finish two randomly selected tasks, one task using the interpretable synthesizer and the one task using the black box synthesizer. And the result is quite interesting. As shown in this, uh, you know, this bar chart, participants did pretty well on the easy task regardless which synthesizer, uh, whether regardless which synthesizer they use, the black box synthesizer or you know, the, the interpretable synthesizer. But for this the two challenging tasks, um, five participants in total finished the assigned task using interpretable program census, but none of the participants actually finished the task using a black box census. And I analyzed the post-study survey responses to understand why interpretable census is so helpful uh, in challenging tasks. I found that the main reason is that in challenging tasks, the synthesizer often fails to generate a program within a given time. As a result, users can do nothing but just you know, staring at the window and guessing 
what could probably go wrong is a black box synthesizer. But with the interpretable synthesis, you can actually troubleshoot and get more insights about the synthesis process, like which search direction the synthesizer was wasting a lot of time on. Then we can actually provide some strategy feedback, like eliminating a search path that looks unproductive to them uh, from the tree visualization I showed you earlier. So in summary, I just showed you two systems and demonstrated how we can redesign existing programming tools to address the needs of real users and help them gain insights and build confidence on the automation process in a programming tool. Um, with AI and, uh, you know, in the future, I think that with this AI and uh, ML techniques becoming more prevalent, we are kind of like at the beginning of a profound change in programming and software development. So in one dimension, there are many programming tools being renovated, you know, with machine learning models. In another dimension, many AI driven applications like autonomous driving systems are becoming more popular and prevalent. And in the meantime, there are more domain experts uh, who are eager to leverage programming and AI-based technologies to fulfill their special needs. And so I believe there are a lot of research opportunities um, you know, to bring human-centered intelligence along each dimension. And in the next few slides, I will just uh, quickly show you some examples that I feel super excited about. Um, for example, given a natural language programming tool covered by um, GPT-3, there are many interesting research questions we can investigate. For example, how can we um, help programmers understand the code generation process? How do we incorporate user feedback to repair an incorrect program if, uh, if the model makes a mistake? And how do we elicit the user guidance to solve a complex task by decomposing it into smaller tasks and then composing them together. And together with a PhD student at Harvard, Kren uh, Lingdon, we are actually running a user study with a programming tool powered by GPT-3 to answer these questions now. And in addition to programmers, one group of uh, domain experts I feel very excited about uh, to help with is clinical researchers. Currently, I'm working with uh, Finali Doshi Willis, uh, who is a machine learning professor at Harvard and two psychiatrists, Roy Perlis and Tom McCoy at Mass General Hospital um, on this uh, direction. You know, um, my collaborators actually have been training machine learning models on electronic health records to answer many interesting clinical questions, like what is the risk of a patient being diagnosed or uh, being diagnosed of a particular disease, or what is the dropout rate in a treatment plan. And they often have a hard time understanding this model prediction. So I'm actually building uh, interactive visual analytics tools to help them investigate and explore the underlying training data to make sense of this model prediction. And more recently, my collaborators and I did an interview and large scale survey with autonomous driving system developers. We found that even though there are many auto automated testing generation techniques for driving models, these tools actually do not generate test cases developers really care about. So instead of using this automated tools, uh, developers prefer to you know, describe traffic scenarios by themselves. And those traffic scenarios are often very um, complex and to be you know, generated by this automated tools. So I think we should build more usable testing tools to address the pr protection, um, protectioners needs for this autom autonomous driving systems. And finally, I hope I have uh, convinced you that the, about the importance of human-centered intelligence. Even though my research is mostly in this uh, programming domain, um, there are a few things I think we can generalize to other domains as well. First, you know, instead of making assumptions about uh, our users based on our own experience, I think it's very important to talk to real users and identify their needs first before building the tool. And the second, in many cases, human users, they are actually capable of doing many things and they are willing to provide guidance to an intelligent tool. So we should actually design mechanisms, interact, interaction mechanisms for soliciting human guidance um, to instead of you know, just letting users passively wait for the prediction results or automation results. And finally, 
I think we should really help users understand the automation process and the automation results so they can actually build trust on the automation and provide effective feedback. Thank you all for listening. I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, thanks, Tianyi, uh, for the very uh, informative talk. I do see that Craig has raised his hand. So Craig, please unmute and just ask a question. Uh, okay, unfortunately, we're not able to turn on my video for some reason. So I'll just ask with the video off. Uh, really nice talk. Thanks for the talk. It was really quite interesting. Uh, I was wondering in the first part of the talk, so uh, I like the idea that you presented, but what I'm wondering is how do you avoid the system from generating a bunch of incorrect API usages, right? Because you mentioned early, early in the talk that you know 88% of some API people were using wrong. So now it's gonna just promote those incorrect ones as well as the correct ones. Yeah, um, so we actually did some data cleaning uh, in the pre data pre-processing um, process. We used uh, some signals like uh, you know the quality um, like the GitHub stars to select the um, you know code program source code that has uh, um, high quality, um, and we are also only looking at you know the GitHub repositories um, that have uh, more than have a long history and have a large uh, development uh, team. So because this uh, kind of uh, GitHub repositories often have high quality, well tested code instead of uh, you know um, some toy. Uh, projects on GitHub like student solutions. So that's one way uh, to do that. And the people can also you know, find, use other ways. For example, there is many linkers and the bug detection tools out there that people can it's, uh, easily run all these uh, tools, the bug detection tools on the code base, and then figure out those code um, that have uh, bugs or use deprecated APIs to improve the quality of the code coffers and code examples. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks, I, I think previously, Keith, you also had a question, although it was sent to uh, panelists only. Do you want to unmute and ask that question? Uh, yes, thank you. So the question I had was, um, uh, one of your goals that, that you stated early on, uh, Tianyi, was uh, getting user feedback and also offering alternative um, suggestions rather than the most common pattern for, uh, for code generation. And I was thinking, uh, is this inspired by uh, say um, commercial automated translation? Namely, I recall with Google Translate, you uh, can not only get a translation but get common alternative translations. And I believe you can actually uh, send a, a, a a little message saying whether the translation was correct or not. Um, do do was this an inspiration or was is this alike to what to what your your goal is with code? I think that something happens in parallel. You know, uh, inductive programming and uh, um, is is a uh, is a research that has a long history and uh, back in the sixties and uh, actually seventies, um, and the people have been working on it uh, quite a bit. And recently, you know, people start to uh, formulate this problem um, by changing it to uh, kind of like uh, using neural translation and neural machine translation models to solve the problem. Um, and uh, I think that there is definitely something shared um, in common um, in, in the design perspective, like uh, showing alternative uh, implementations, et cetera, um, and showing more signals about the quality um, of, the, of the generated code. So I think it, but uh, it's the inspiration is not actually directly from um, the Google translation, et cetera, but it's more kind of like uh, uh, from the limitations of the previous work and also from uh, what we heard from a user study, not just our user studies, but also other folks who have done from HCI and PL who have done user studies to understand the real usage of uh, this kind of uh, tools. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, Chen, it's, it's quite interesting to see that you and your colleague are also thinking about machine reading comprehension or medical reports. I actually also am working with Alex Boy on the similar topic. So we definitely should discuss about this. Uh, so I do have another question for you. Uh, I, I think the, the you know, short demo or the video 
that is embedded in your slides, which is about you know using GPT three to automatically automatically generate code based on description. My understanding is that that that's a kind of both controllable and a constrained NLG. But uh, uh, okay, the, the the output is no longer a natural language, but a programming language. I think at here the question would be: Do you think it's uh because you know GPT three the the inference we we know that's a super large model, so the inference cost is very huge. Do you think it's a realistic solution to actually apply a model that is as large as GPT three to to solve this problem, or do you think we should actually focus on smaller but uh, you know more specialized model to do this kind of controlled NLG, no programming generation, sorry, not NLG, yeah. Yeah, I think for program generation specifically, I think the GPT is uh, GPT three, and also especially this uh, the more recent uh, model behind the Copilot, which is repurposed um, fine tuned from GPT three, is is a very promising direction. Uh, I know there is a lot of criticisms about uh, large language models, about the carbon footprint, and many other things. But I think this is a promising direction. Because in, uh, in software engineer and PL, there has been already uh, some empirical studies on some smaller like uh, transformers and uh, their effectiveness uh, uh, um, code generation. And uh, no matter from the benchmark perspective or from a user study pro perspective, the number one big issue is that those models um, are not very accurate. So accuracy still is the, the big issue. Um, in, especially like if, when we are addressing some complex programming tasks. So people observe that if a model has low accuracy, by right, generating some bad code, and then people will quickly stop using it and feel frustrated um, about the tool. Um, but GB3 on the other hand has been shown doing very well on many common tasks compared with uh, like, for example, GPT2, which is uh, smaller than GPT3. Um, so I think, um, and, and that there, it just gives a very good foundation, even though GPT-3 also has uh, some limitations, like the code generated by it may still have many errors, um, but it's uh, GPT-3 is very good at getting maybe 80% of the code correct. And the users probably using some uh, support, uh, interaction support can finish the last 20%, which probably requires the most creativity you know, programming task. So I think, um, I, I personally feel very excited about, about this direction, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, indeed, this direction is very exciting. So definitely, I think, you know, because GPT-3 is something you will never fit into a commodity server. So definitely developing a smaller, uh, more efficient model could be a solution. Over there, I think we probably need to think about continual learning and also your your thoughts about human in the loop could be very useful. I, I'm guessing in, in cases, uh, you, you, you use the model to actually generate the code. If the code is incorrect, we should we could ask the user to always give feedback. Absolutely. To, yeah, Absolutely. and then do it continuous. I think it's gonna be a huge, it's gonna be a huge scene, like if you can compress the model into a smaller one, um, but still have comparable performance. So that's gonna be a big deal. Yep. Also, I think over here, there will always be another issue about, for example, you know, early days, Bert, or this kind of, for train transformers, there's a less limit. So nowadays people are developing things like long homer or big bird, which focuses on how to, how to encode, you know, language context, which are very long, like the entire document, the entire article. So at here, you know, since we, we, we don't know a program, how long can that be? So definitely, I also think there, there will be the same problem as here. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Any um, other questions from the audience? Okay, I guess uh, if you have more questions, please feel free to reach out to Professor Tian Yi Zhang uh, through email and uh, yeah, thanks again for uh, 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 for giving this very informative and rich talk, Tian Yi. That is very uh, inspiring, and uh, actually, I'm already starting to think about how to incorporate some of your ideas of human in the loop into evaluating uh, natural language generation and uh, natural language understanding models. Yeah, let's uh, continue to discuss this in one on one. Yeah, so thanks. Mm -hmm.
Thank you all for coming um, and asking great questions. Thank you.